Eguerdion. Good morning again. We return to the program of this Congress, World Federation of Colleges and Polytechnics, this time with many participants on stage to talk to us about views of the world. We have with us Roger Ramsamy, president of the ha Hudson Valley Community College from United States. Joaquim James Calleja, president of the European Forum of Technical and Vocational Education and Training from Malta. Ali Al Nagbi, director of Abu Dhabi Polytechnic from United Arab Emirates. Hipei, director of the Department of Vocational Education and Professional Training at the China Education Association for International Exchange, who will join us by video. Jefferson Manjais de Acevedo, Rector and Fluminense Federal Institute Coordinator at the CONIF International Affairs Chamber from Brazil. Kurat Ul Ain Navid, Program Director and CEO of the Institute of Tourism and Hotel Management from Pakistan. And the chairperson of this space, Mary Faraoni, Chief Executive at the Holmes Glen Institute from Australia. I give you the floor. Buenos dias and good morning, although I think it's just after uh, the morning. It's my great pleasure to be here today uh, with my fellow panellists to talk about the views of the world. Um, I'm on the, uh, the board of uh, the Federation and it's a, a great privilege for me to be on that board because of um, uh, the, the other board members and listening to what's going on around the world. So it's great for me personally and also professionally to be involved. Um, this morning has been really interesting um, from the point of view of picking up the theme in particular of the future of work, which we will be picking up in this panel today. But some of the things that really came out to me um, in regards to um, what what we know is happening around us, but what is the impact for us as providers of vocational education and training? And that's what I'm hoping that uh, our panel will unpack a little bit. But some of the ideas from this morning, um, I really like the, the uh, quote from Mandela about decisions based on hopes, not fears, because you tend to get into, uh, as a CEO, uh, obviously decision making is very important, but I really like the idea that you do that out of hope. Um, obviously, in order to do what we need to do, we need to have policy structures that support what we do. Um, and we also need to have investment. So that's the, that's the side issue of government and what governments need to do to support us in our role um, as providers of um, vocational education and training. I think um, the, we heard a lot about technology and technology change. I'm just hopeful that one day I'll be able to transport myself to San Sebastian from Australia without having to get on a plane for 24 hours. Yes. <laughs> um, look, all colleges and polytechnics share a similar mission um, and it's education for all, ensuring access and equity and supporting social inclusion and social um, inclusion, uh, social cohesion and social inclusion through education and training. We know education changes lives and education and education, training and skills development supports the economic, um, the economy in each of our countries. The past two and a half years have been challenging. 2020 was a year when the world seemed to stop and it was a, a time when I think as a world we shared our experiences with humanity and empathy. Since then there seems to be a slight fracturing uh, I think of structures and it's almost like the world sort of a bit skewed on its axis um, and we are not quite sure or we're not, we, we're not sure quite how to recalibrate and that's certainly the experience I have um, in Australia. And it's certainly something I'm grappling with as CEO of my organisation there. Um, work is changing, work practices are changing. 
people's expectations are changing. Our workplace um, is also heavily impacted. Uh, there's been accelerated change, as we know, with technology innovation. And there are signs that the structures and operating models that many of us may have in our organisations um, that were probably fit for purpose in 2019 may not be fit for purpose in 2023 and beyond. So this is why the conference themes of the future of work, migration, sustainability, equity and inclusion are really pertinent for us today. They pose big questions and issues for us all in TVET, in the TVET community to consider. So today we're really fortunate to have um, views from across the world um, to provide a global perspective of TVET and in particular um, TVET's engagement with the key themes of the conference and how we can thrive in uncertain and challenging times and respond to a changing world of work, not only for our students, uh, but for our industry partners, but also for our own workplaces and our own workforce. Um, I'll ask the, um, so what we're trying to do is a bit interactive today, so I'll ask panellists a question and then other panellists may comment um, on that particular answer. So let's kick off. And the first question I'm going to ask Jefferson. Um, following COVID, we are seeing significant change in the way we work, live and learn. Is TVET, as it is in your country, up to the challenge, or do you, do you require a new model of TVET? Um, good morning for all. Uh, first of all, I will be glad to be here. And uh, we needed to stress that we are a survivor of the biggest project in the last years in the world. A lot of people probably would be here with us, and we lost them. And for them, we needed to be uh, <clears throat> conscious about the great challenge for all of us. We see a lot of things that uh, we are proud. The great engagement and the world <coughs> to uh, uh, create the vaccine. <coughs> but uh, a lot of things that shame us, for example, to deny the science in a lot of countries. Uh, the education, we, perce we perceive that the education needed to be explore and develop a deep knowledge for new economy, for new technologies. But uh, we are facing a greatest uh, big challenge than the pandemic, that is climate change. And because that, we need to prepare our students to the awareness and the behavior for a sustainable world. But uh, it's not sufficient to, and we need, and I learned last year here and is aligned with what in Brazil is our perception. We need to prepare the people to living together and the humanity, the humanization is so important. And I think the three pillars is so, I need to stress, new economy, new te technology, sustainability, world, and the capacities and the humanity values, ethics, and compromise with all the people, not only uh, groups that the historical is privileged in our countries. Okay, just to follow up then, Jefferson, do you think though what you have in Brazil is, is, is able to adapt for what you just talked about? Yes, we are trying to do that because education is an open book. It's all the time we need to improve what we are doing, and we are trying to change uh, in these three uh, uh, principal uh, uh, ways. Uh, it's, it's necessary to change every time, and we try to do that. Okay, I might go to someone who wants to comment. Curat? Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you very much. So if I'm talking about Pakistan, so Pakistan is a country of 112 million of the population, and our youth bulge is around 65% of uh, age between 17 to 29. 
So it's a big challenge to brought that human resource, uh, these young people into the vet sector, because in Pakistan, um, this vet concept is quite new. It's like 20, 30 years back, we have started working in the wet sector. So still, it's a taboo for the people. And when it comes towards this pandemic, we have seen that we are lacking a lot towards the technology side. Because we are, uh, we are having human capital, but when it comes towards the technology and automation, we are lacking that. So our TWIT system needs a lot of uh, work to be focused on. And at the same time, we are already lacking uh, towards the horizontal and vertical progression toward the journal education, which people wanted for their kids. They want to make them doctors and engineers, and they don't want to make them the technical support persons. But looking in the pandemic, I have seen, because I'm running a hospitality institution, Many entrepreneurs came out in this uh, uh, situation of COVID-19. So the people need a digital training that how they can become the entrepreneurs, how they can sell online. So um, yes, our model needs a lot of work to do. And we are looking towards the donors which are working in Pakistan for uh, developing our TV system more towards this digitalization thing. OK, so follow up question. Um, Given the fast pace of uh, technological change, how can we as providers, because many of us have uh, facilities that is not up to date with industry, generally speaking, so how do we um, develop and deliver the required skills in the new era? James. First of all, um, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. <coughs> um, after two years, because I was here in 2019, so it's, it's quite a privilege to be back in the same hall after two years and after COVID. Um, I, I'm running a college of about 8,000 plus students. So um, with over 18% coming from, from outside my country, which is Malta, which is a very small country, 500,000 people. And the most effective way of inculcating in young people the importance of linking the world of employment with that of education is by bringing industry on campus. And we have a huge program. You would be amazed to learn that we have about 1,800 industry partners. And the reason why we want industry on campus is because my feeling and that of some of my colleagues is that Young people are not any more attracted to the formal education that we, we know about. Some of, our, some of our students tell us that it, it's boring to be in a lecture room, in a workshop, in a laboratory, and seeing James speaking all the time or telling us what we have to do. Because what we have to do, we, we just Google, we just connect with Madam YouTube or Twitter or TikTok or whatever it is, and we learn. So what do you want? We want to work and learn. And this is what really triggered why we would like employers to be teachers on campus. It's not an easy paradigm shift because, as many of you would experience, um, teachers' unions would not accept employers as teachers, of course. We are the teachers, they are the employers. But unless we, we bridge this gap between what is happening in a formal education and context with that what is happening in places of work, we've seen this morning some very good presentations, so it's very difficult for me to say something new, but what we learn out of, out of these presentations is that the world of employment and the world of education are so, so, so linked to each other that, and the, the world of employment is becoming so very attractive to young people, I, I can elaborate with that. For example, we lose as a college. Now we are a, a small college, but we lose about 600 students every year. 600 students that enroll in September disappear in February of the same year. And we wanted to know why. And the reason is very clear. We have found employment, we are getting paid, and it is much more exciting to be with employers, to be with employees, to, 
to navigate with new technology, to be in nicer rooms, and uh, you know, this is the, this is reality. So, to your question, what the challenge is, I think the challenge is for us as training providers <coughs> to um, to really link with the world of employment and to bring really the world of employment on the campuses where we teach, where we provide students with the experience. And we need to compete in a way with the employers to retain our students, our learners, in what we call lifelong learning. We heard, yeah, I, I agree, and we heard this morning about the centres of vocational education, which is basically that point of having industry on campus. Uh, Roger, would you like to comment on that notion of technological change and what James has just said as well? Absolutely. And so, in, I'm Roger Ramsamy from New York. Uh, and in the United States, one of the things that we did when COVID came about is we reacted to the environment. We basically took education and threw it online and began to teach folks how to do skills work from technology that was basically antiquated to how skills were obtained. And we find ourselves in, in a place where we are now struggling, struggling in the sense that kids have gone out, learned the fundamentals of how to get through on work online, and they're not willing to come back onto the campuses to get the skills training that is so needed right now in order for us to get where we need to. We find industries have realized that with the lack of individuals wanting to come back out of work and the skills that are needed, that the focus is to get away. Even industries are focused on how do we get away from that formalized training. And a lot of kids today we know have struggled in the past. This is an old way where math and English have been always the fundamental thing that have held folks back from moving on. So how do you incorporate that which is needed in the skills that are needed and just really focusing on providing kids the skills where they will be more successful and what you just heard about the dropout rate and those things can easily be mitigated and these individuals can go out into the workforce. So lots of industries are now investing more money on how to get kids with the skills directly for their job sites and put them back out. And they help with that skills, they help with the technology that would allow us to just do that one job. Mm. It poses questions for us, as I said um, in the opening, about funding, how we actually fund education and training in each of our countries, and policy that supports that. Ali, would you like to comment from your perspective? Of course, Mark. thank you very much. Uh, good, afternoon, uh, good afternoon, or good morning. It's, uh, Good morning, I think. Oh, good afternoon. Um, I'm very glad, I'm very happy that um, um, I am talking to you, and I'm very sure here be um, uh, with us um, more experience than us, but um, um, let's uh, share some of our um, ideas and um, the experience that we have been through in, uh, in UAE. Uh, I am running a college of uh, engineering technology and health uh, care, um, and we have around 8,000 students. Uh, the beauty about Polytechnic Abu Dhabi, uh, we don't accept the students unless they are sponsored. So we, ha we, we, we help you to get you sponsored from industry, and then we enroll you in Polytechnic Abu Dhabi. Within four years, you get your higher diploma or diploma or applied bachelor, and then you are ready for, for work. What happened during the pandemic, because it was around two years, we lost the beauty of our skills we given back to our students on those two years. And then we realized that what we've been doing in the first two years of the student's life in Polytechnic Abu Dhabi, it's almost general education without single hands-on skills. And then we went back to the regulator. We told them, hey, this is what we are doing, and this is what you force us to do. But this is not the needed by industry. And we talked to the industry, and we told them we have to shift the paradigm now. We have to give them the skills in the first two years. If they leave within two years, then they have enough skills to work. And whatever edu general education later on can be given in the third and the fourth year. And that's what happened, and that's what we realized back in UAE. 
So the pillars are not only the teachers themselves, the regulators, they have to understand that this is the time to change. If we don't change, today we will be behind. And what is happening in the last two years, it will last with us for another maybe 15 years. And what happened in UAE, we, because of this um, change and agree with the, with the regulators and the accreditors, we have been moved in our rank from 30th into something within the 10 in the Tibet education, which that is very glad. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great, and uh, congratulations on that move as well. I think you pick up the, the notion that um, what we're seeing is going to stay with us a long time. Um, in Australia, we're actually experiencing virtually full employment. Um, we've got limited migration, and vocational education and training was heralded as the way to get ourselves out of the pandemic with reskilling and upskilling. However, what we're seeing, and I'm really interested in what uh, uh, my fellow panellists also are seeing, but what, what we're seeing in Australia is decreased demand uh, for vocational uh, education and training. Uh, because students can go get jobs, as James, you were saying um, as well. So students are getting jobs without qualifications. Um, is this, uh, it's a question I'm going to ask all of you, but is this a worrying sign for the future? And I know we've got um, panellists um, in the next uh, two days talking about micro-credentials as well, but is this a worrying sign for the future? And if so, how can we recalibrate the market to ensure TVET continues to have relevance in the future. Jefferson, I'll start with you. Okay, um, the, the dialogue with the society, the dialogue with the product sector is so important. Um, now we are facing Brazil, uh, a great problem. Uh, the students, the increase is students drop out of the system. Part of the economic issues, the students needed to uh, look for uh, a job, and the part of them is with a uh, great of our students don't have access, uh, adequate the internet access and the suitable equipment. 86% uh, of the schools report problems with the in the pandemic time because the, the, the access of the internet. Uh, and the, uh, these challenges for us, uh, I think uh, we don't have uh, the needed vacance for all the students that want to be with us, but sometimes our curriculum needs to be more flexible. Uh, it's a great possibility. I, I don't like to say opportunity in the tragic time, but possibility. We have a lot of lessons and I hope we have learning about that. But uh, the possibility to intensive the use of technology, create more, approach more uh, feasible for adequate for working students and for older students for a long line of learning. I think we need to re-engineer our curriculum to be more suitable for someone that can't uh, spend all of your time or a long time in our institution. We need to think about the working students and older students. It's a great opportunity to change our curriculum to, and our space to engage the people in the process of transformation and to the education. Okay, thanks, Jefferson. Kurat, um, could you comment as well, and also sort of picking up that notion of is the full qualification a dead concept in some ways? Yeah, 
Uh, so looking upon the current uh, situation as uh, with the COVID, the, definitely the job market has suffered a lot all across the world. But if I look at the dynamics of Pakistan, it's a little bit different for us because uh, before that, our inbound tourism was not so much at the peak. But with the pandemic, our people, when they were restricted to travel outside, they were traveling inside the Pakistan. And even in um, this uh, era of pandemic of two years, we uh, got a lot of opportunities from different employers to get our uh, students uh, for the jobs. Uh, but at the same time, when we are looking about the uh, digitalization and uh, uh, automated solutions coming into the TVET education, we need to upskill and reskill our current uh, uh, workforce because these students, they must have a knowledge about the digitalization in their curriculums, which, which was never been a part. If I look about the, again, if I look about the hospitality industry, the things are changing. Uh, instead of humans, now the robots are served in different restaurants so now we have to look upon the demand that how the things are going to be happen and how we have to inculcate um, these changes in our curriculum it's very much important that we should add the artificial intelligence and uh, digitalization concept inside our curriculums. So that's need a lot of revision um, every time. And second, the most important thing, because I work for the Chamber of Commerce as well, so it's important that we should uh, uh, look for TVIT graduates to become entrepreneurs. So entrepreneurship must be added to the curriculums, because uh, uh, if we were not having a lot more jobs, then we can get them into small little businesses and they can earn very good handsome amount of uh, money from uh, those small little businesses. Okay, thank you. Roger. Yes, and so I would like to ask everyone here, by the raise of hands, how many of you have told your young ones that success means to become a lawyer, to become a doctor? If you raise your hands, how many of you have shared that with your young ones? Raise your hands. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I don't believe all of you. <laughs> <laughs> the fact is that we know in, a, in the United States, success means to work in the hospital as a doctor, to work as a lawyer, to work in that office that gains you the best view of the river or whatever. That is success. And the mindset is what I have to say to you. The mindset that this is what success is, what's killing our growth in every industry in the United States, I feel, and I believe it's happening around the world. Vocational education represents about 56% of the workforce in America. We do all of the training that represents that large workforce. And it's difficult to maintain that when you have politics and education mixing with each other because you have leaders who may not be well aware of that need and how to speak for it. And they clash. When you begin to move forward with an idea, the idea becomes dead the moment you change the government. If we are indeed to keep our workforce, it starts from having an, a, a system that is built with the understanding of what it means to forward vocational education. And until then, it's never going to go anywhere. It will start and will begin to fall. And I can say for sure that for us, we focus on that in so many ways of how to mitigate those obstacles and do what we can. And now we're working in several countries to help them do this. But a tough job. It is a tough job and it is challenging and that's why I think government and government policies and, and investment in Tibet is really important, just as you've said. In Australia we've had uh, recently a change of government um, and uh, they talk about technical and further education providers that what, where uh, I work um, and the, the value of vocational education training and now are supporting that with free tuition uh, for many programs in high priority areas. So they're following up on that. Um, James, would you like to comment just on perhaps what you've heard to date? Yeah, yeah. interesting to know that um, in my frequent dialogues with my students, I realize that they are much, much smarter than we think mm. and much more intelligent than probably we were when we were at their age. 
they realize that if they want to experience the, the speed of change, they don't co go to a college, but they stay at home. They don't tap a college or a polytechnic, but they go straight into employment, and then they come to college. So it made me realize, and many of our colleagues, that when you have and when you talk for a long time about curricula and timetables and programs of studies and how many credits and at what time and how many breaks and when should we give an assignment and when sh should we get it back and what type of dissertation and how many number of... I mean, this is a language which we enjoy talking about, but it's not the language of the young generation. And you, you realize when, when you talk to them that, number one, the one size fits all, it's not applicable anymore. And we tend, as teachers, because I, I have been a teacher for many years, and, and this is why I, I, I love EVID, because we are training providers and we, we are doing real VET, all of us here. You, you realize that because one size doesn't fit all, we tend, as teachers, to look at the macro, at a class, 30 people, 20, 25, but they, they consider the micro as the most important. Who is this person? One interesting aspect that we realized when all of a sudden we woke up with COVID, because it was the, the greatest transformer and reformer in our education system, COVID. We've been talking about reforms for decades. All of a sudden in March 2020, we woke up and all of us became experts on Teams and on, you know, intranet and all the time. So when, when, when you talk to students and you realize that the micro is important in which respect, in the respect that we need to understand where, where they're coming from and the, where they wish to go. So when we went online, we realized that about 150 of our students didn't have access to internet didn't have access. Now, in, in my country, 98% of our population is on in, in, internet every day or mobile, etc. But we realized we had students who couldn't go there. And we realized as well that most of the students, although they were enthusiastic about going online, sleeping late, waking up later, um, uh, listening to the lecture, lecturer in pajamas, or uh, we don't even know how or why, because we were not seeing any, any faces at times, they realize that this is not the life they want, you see. So, in conclusion here, we are emphasizing three acronyms at my college. One is industry on campus. We want to see the employers more there. Secondly, and this ties to the topic, to the theme of this conference, community social responsibility. And it's become obligatory in our college that they should spend minimum of 25 to 30 hours in the community doing community work and get a credit for it. And the third and most important is work-based learning. You cannot be at the college, earn a certification, go to, into employment without having a certified experience in the real world of employment. For many of the students, it is working. But, of course, you will find those pockets of students who want to come to college, remain there, do their assignments, submit their assignments and dissertations, get their qualifications, and go and find an employment. So, different, yeah. different scenarios. Uh, before I go to Ali, just to comment, I think the, the notion of digital exclusion is one that we shouldn't lose. Mm. Uh, it was mentioned um, this morning, and many countries around the world will have experience of their students with digital exclusion. So how do we adapt to that? Ali. Yeah, thank you, Mary. It's um, fourth industrial revolution. We're already in. If you don't believe so, then we, you have to think it twice. From mass production, where all fit, uh, one fits all, into customization. The students should understand, and the parents of the community and industry, they should understand that it is customized kind of a production. If you want your shampoo, then you have to go to the net, go to that X company, and you put the genetic kind sequence of yourself and you will receive your shampoo, which fits only to you in one day time. Manufactured, customized by you. It needs so 
many of automation, manufacturing, avionics, not conventional mechanical. It's more into smart. I think industry should talk back to polytechnics, and we should listen to them, what they want, and we have very good experience uh, with the nuclear program. Two years back, we graduated operators for them in, in, in Abu Dhabi, one of the nuclear plants in Abu Dhabi, and they came back to us, they said, we don't want any more operators, we want to shift into something else. If we did not listen to them, at that time, two years back, we will end up closing that program now. Mm. So it's very important we listen to industry. So the relationship between industry and the polytechnics and the colleges is very important. And that is, that's one thing. The other thing, and to my um, humble experience, a prior learning, which you mentioned it little, um, we have to give an opportunity for people who escape education and went to work, and they gathered huge skills from the war. When they come back, unfortunately, a few years back, before the pandemic, we tell them, sorry, either you are over age, this is a very silly <laughs> excuse to reject the application, or you did not have X or Y qualification, we cannot admit you. This is a big mistake. After the pandemic, post-pandemic situation criteria for admission and what we are uh, trying to do, we succeed with a couple of ap applicants and they are happy, we are very happy and it is like it's a success story. We recognized what they have done in their workplace. We articulated so many credits when they come back to the class, they will enhance the discussion in the class for those youth students who just came from the secondary school. It is very interactive. So I believe a prior learning or recognition of prior learning is a very important and the future of the Tibet. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mary. Wonderful. Um, I'm not sure what time we're on, uh, what time we've got left. Cause, uh, One hour. <laughs> no, we haven't. As, uh, as adaptable training providers, we've been asked to shorten this session, but I'm not quite sure. I think we've only got a few minutes left, so I can't see an ego anywhere, but I think that's what we will do. So, given the time constraints, I'm going to ask each of you, what would be the one thing that you would implement, if you could, and don't worry about policy or funding or anything like that, the barriers that you talked about, Roger, what is the one thing that you would implement that you think would make a significant change in outcomes for students, um, in what you do? Jefferson. Um, one thing is so difficult. I know, but, but we, we've got time limits okay, here. We could talk all uh, afternoon. <laughs> if uh, I needed to choose, uh, I think... Uh, we need to invest our institution in ed uh, teacher education and training education because we need to prepare our schools, our Tibet school, but the school system to prepare new generation and our teachers need support to uh, use creatively, competently, uh, and critical the technology. It's not to be in front of the computer or pass some uh, activities to students. We need to use the technology in pedagogical way. It's a great challenge, <coughs> and our system could uh, help the system to prepare the students with basic skills and uh, in, the f in the future go to our st institution to prepare the new generation of worker profession to transform the life and the world. Okay, thank you. Kurat? Uh, so what I see a lack uh, in Pakistani TV system, it's actually 
uh, the industrial and institutional partnership, uh, which is lacking. Uh, we started the Sector Skill Council, but we just started, we managed to start only in two or three priority fields. So what I see a lack is actually, we are training our uh, human resource in TVIT sector on the old tradition basis. And the industry has been changing and transforming every day, um, whether it's about the digitalization, automation, new technologies. So our country um, is famous for textile exports. If I talk about the textile thing. Um, uh, textile is 52% uh, of the um, uh, total population GDP is coming from that. So in textile, when we train our students in the wet sectors, the industry says that this is not up to the mark or the need of the requirements. Maybe we need such type of human resource five years back. Similar is the challenge with the hospitality and tourism industry and with other industries as well. So what thing I always uh, find missing is bringing the industry and academia on the same table and to prepare the curriculum according to the need of the time so the human resource which were graduating from the vet schools would be getting more and more jobs. So similarly for the global market, if this industrial um, training would be implicated and the industry would be helping us uh, to deliver that programs, then definitely our students can go into the international market more well. Because um, as I told you that we have a big population and that can become economic revolution to the country if they are trained well and exported well into the international market. So um, for me, this is the biggest uh, thing I wanted that the industry and academia should come together and uh, should reform. Good, good luck with that one. Roger? Yes, and so I would like to, if I had to do one thing, and as you can see, it's very difficult to pick one thing, but I, I say if it's only one thing, then I'm going to think much bigger. And the fact that I don't believe that waters separate the land mass. We are one world, a global world, that has to work together in order to change what we perceive as our function to exist. When we look around and we ask the main questions, what do we as humans need in order to survive, we can pick out the fundamentals. Yes, the fundamentals will be just our water, our food, and oxygen. But if you take from those three the very in the very thing that give rise to all of them, if we work together and look around at all the institutions around the world, each and every one of us do something that is unique. What if all of us were to utilize our ability to come together and work as one, as one, we may be able to refine this world and allow all of us to survive and exist. And I say that because we have so much that's going on, and I want to give an example. For a, we have 10 young ladies coming from Accra, Ghana, to work with us. These 10 young ladies, they are young ladies in their countries that are looked as second-class citizens. Secondly, they're women who were never given really chances. They come to us, and we will be providing them training in solar production to train others, so it's train the trainer. These 10 kids can go back home and train others where we can now focus on another 10 that comes to us and we are going to be training the next 10 in how to do dr willing, uh, well drilling, drilling for water. Now understand the concept, the 10 that went back learn how to generate electricity. The other 10 comes to us and they learn how to dig for water. Imagine the 10 can now provide electricity for the 10 just to learn how to dig for water. They can find water in the arid lands for agriculture. They can now make a massive difference by continuing to train others. That same support can be transcended among everything that we talk about here today. And I would ask all of us to think about that. How do we not think of this world from Australia or just Brazil or just your own country but how do we think globally of how we all can work together and change this world forever? Thank you.
Thanks, Roger. And uh, hopefully uh, events like this with uh, the World Federation of Colleges and, uh, and Polytechnics is a way at least to bring people together to start talking about those ideas. Ali. Actually, I picked that, but uh, I have to change it now into something <laughs> uh, difficult. Uh, collaboration. It's actually... Um, um, I went one day, uh, I uh, took over Polytechnic Abu Dhabi in 2018. And since that time, we were doing so many things, locally and internationally. And then I went for ranking. I thought, why we don't rank Abu Dhabi Polytechnic where it is? And I served so many ranking bodies here and there, and I ended up by, you are not doing any research. You are not doing any patents. You don't have H indexes, and so on and so others with all these silly kind of criteria. And then I went back and said, we cannot. We cannot rank ourselves, but we have the highest employability rate in Abu Dhabi and UAE and maybe in Gulf States too. That doesn't mean anything. I have the best skilled people who are hired in the third year even before they graduate. That doesn't mean anything to the ranking. And so on and so others. But because of the limited time, if I want to see something, I want to see something about ranking our polytechnics and colleges, which is far away from that conventional criteria. We, but we do patents, yes, but we don't, we, we don't do the patents because of the sake of the patents, because of the sake of the H indexes and others, but because of the commercialization. If we are getting something out of it, tangible, and instead of the intangible, if there is one thing that it would give me an opportunity to change, then I would love to see from this organization a ranking body help us to rank our polytechnics to encourage others to reach into that um, excellency. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ali. James. Uh, thank you, Roger, for reminding us two, two things which are, I think, very, very interesting, that 2.9 billion people have no access to internet in the world. Mm. And every day, more than 30,000 die of hunger. So we take many things for granted. But if I were to choose one thing, which I always talk about at college, for, for VET or for VPET, as we call it, is to embrace transformation all the time, whether it's the curriculum, whether it's your vision of employment, whether it's your rapport with the, with the employers, whether it's timetabling, whether it's the workload, whether it's the number of credits in a program. We need to embrace transformation in the, not just the pedagogical, but also in our management of colleges and polytechnics. Because if we don't change, the world will change us. And many people out there, including politicians, expect us to change. At least in my country, no one questions what is happening in compulsory education. No one questions. No one questions our university. And this is not just in our country. These are two sectors no one or very few ask questions about. If there is a crisis, the minister comes knocking on my door. He comes knocking on your doors. So here, I think, if we need to embrace transformation, one of the things we need to spearhead, even as Evet or as a huge organization such as yours, is that the sectors of education should come together. We are not there as a remedial class or a, or a, um, a, a, a casual toward, as I normally call it. It might be too late at the age of 17 for a child, for a young person, to be given the opportunities to learn and work. So for me, embracing transformation means, even as a mindset, being a teacher, I never thought that work is much more attractive than learning. I, I have been brought up in a family where learning is everything. But for the new generation, for the new young people coming up today, where technology is giving them all the opportunities in the world, what to look for, what to learn, what to do, how to enjoy themselves, 
Yes, working, doing things which are practical, wise hands, as one Danish author calls it, wise hands. Because when you use your hand, you need to use your brain. But we were brought up thinking that this is something which you do automatically, and this is something which is cognitive, which is beyond your imagination. So my, my advice would be embracing transformation in polytechnics and colleges in order to attract and retain learners for as long as possible in lifelong learning. Great. Thank you. Again, a really good um, example, I think, of uh, how uh, we could change the way it's the status. That what you're talking about is changing the way people view Tibet as well. Um, I've got a big sign here saying time's out. So I think we need to finish off. But what I just want to do is just quickly summarise what fantastic um, panellists today, but some of the ideas that have come out today. Um, is global collaboration and, and benchmarking was one of those ideas and I think something, um, Dawn, that maybe we look at um, with the uh, Federation. Um, the importance of flexibility and not a single solution in regards to what we do with curriculum. Obviously, industry partnerships, um, centres of, of excellence, that notion certainly came out. Curriculum uh, redesign. I think that notion of how we focus or refocus the status of VET in line with schools and universities, um, looking at a tertiary sector that is seamless, uh, not in segmented parts. We need to think as a student. Remember, they're the ones, and I think, James, you gave some great uh, examples of that. Credit, RPL, how we use that. Teacher training and the importance of teacher training. Our teachers are the ones on the ground who are facing our students. Um, and of course, supporting, in the end, we need the support of um, our governments, um, both from a policy perspective and from a, a funding perspective. But I think to go back, what I opened with, that uh, you make decisions based on hope, not on fear, and I'm very, optimistic about what we can um, do, because I think we do and have done a wonderful job. Thank you. Thank you to our panellists. <laughs>